के सामने राइट क्लिक करो मोर में आएगा पार्टिसिपेंट क्लिक करो एक मिनट ठीक है मेरा नाम क्या है इधर आप डॉक्टर में है ना डॉक्टर दिख रहा ना आपकी इस पर क्लिक करो ना हाँ तो राइट क्लिक करो तो मोर का ऑप्शन आएगा उसमें आया सर मैं नाम कर मैं मैम से अच्छा हाँ। ठीक है ना मैडम आपका नाम रहता ना कुछ तो कुछ आप ऑब्जर्व हो रहे हैं हमारे लिए बहुत अच्छी बात है पर आप नहीं, आपका नाम मुझे तो फोटो में नहीं नहीं फोटो में आपका नाम आना चाहिए आया सर यस यस वी आर वी आर वेरी ग्रेटफुल टू यू दैट यू हैव कम फॉर आवर वेबिनार थैंक यू वेरी मच आई एम ऑल्सो ग्रेटफुल टू यू फॉर ब्रिंगिंग मी एस एम एस ओके सर सो वी आर लाइव नाउ सो शैल आई स्टार्ट ओके सर सो गुड इवनिंग डेलीगेट्स एंड पार्टिसिपेंट्स थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग द शील कनेक्ट एंड टुडे वी हैव अपडेट्स ऑन यूएसजी and this uh, webinar is sponsored by fetal medicine committee am ogs with chaliswar obstetric and gynecology society so before we start with the session let me welcome our moc for today's uh, webinar dr swati m pandar so ma'am is consultant and uh, obstetrician and gynecologist in saint anne's hospital aurangabad uh, ma'am is ex registrar at holy family hospital from delhi and worked as a gynecologist at fortist Love event Delhi, ma'am is winner of Rishikesh Pai and Reshma Pai Quiz 2014, as well as winner of Quest Zone Yuva Foxy Quiz 2014, winner of Usha Krishnan Quiz 2015, and the area of interest is high risk obstetrics and infertility. So we are glad to have you all on our platform for today's uh, session. That is the update of USG, and uh, I welcome you, ma'am, on our platform, and I will hand over the session to you. thank you for kind introduction okay. i welcome all the delegates and all participants this evening so as to attend this webinar on fetal uh, and usg update i uh, invite dr sujit konka sir who is a chairperson of fetal medicine committee of amox to welcome all the delegates and to share details about the webinar good evening dear friends colleagues and seniors i am very much delighted and happy to uh, welcome all delegates all seniors uh, especially dr pk shah sir uh, who has been the pioneer of uh, teaching ultrasonography for obstetricians for this webinar sir i am very very much grateful to you for attending this webinar uh, uh, the most important thing i want to talk today is fetal medicine committee is going to arrange this type of webinar every month and this is going to be a training module type structure that means uh, step wise uh, things are going so who are in fetal imaging or into uh, fetal medicine side who are interested in fetal imaging please stay tuned to us for their uh, uh, good uh, knowledge in this area Now coming to topics today first topic which myself is going to talk is our about early pregnancy and what is abnormal and what is normal so when to pick up uh, abnormal things i am going to talk on that dr prasna shah is going to talk about the genetic markers soft markers in second trimester all of us know the famous markers in first trimester these are uh, local translucency nasal bone ductus venosus and tricuspid and all those things but very less is talked about second trimester soft markers so dr prasna is going to talk on that and dr sachin nichita is going to talk on window of opportunity in nt scan that means in nt scan apart from nt what other things are we going to know for example we uh, structural deformities we know the preeclampsia screening while you are uh, taking the uterine rt pi we know the pre uh, preterm uh, screening when you are getting the cervical length and so on so today's session is going to be very very informative so please tune with us stay tuned with us and uh, i hand over the things to dr swati pariyar for the next proceedings thank you sir i invite and uh, dr yashwant pawar sir who is a president of chaliska obstetric and gynec society to give welcome address and introduction of the program welcome sir uh, i welcome dr mandar karmal karambelkar sir Karambel. who is a secretary of the chaliska obstetric and gynec society 
to give welcome address welcome sir he is a consultant at shelly shobha ivf hospital chalisgaon uh, thank you swati ma'am i am uh, on on set uh, grateful to every person uh, basically uh, usg has now changed into uh, quite a uh, diagnostic modality and everyone or every gynecologist should be well versed with the technique and equipment so uh, this uh, basically webinar arranged by the uh, sir along with uh, uh, our society was really helpful will be really helpful to all of us as a gynecologist and uh, would definitely help to improve the clinical acumen as well as the accuracy thank you thank you sir uh, we have here uh, as a mmc observer dr aparna raul uh, she is running her ivf center uh, she was a, she is a president elect for two, uh, 2023 she has many feathers feathers in her cap she is a gold medalist and many more feathers for her i welcome you ma'am thank I, you swati i yeah you want to speak no thing okay uh, this is an excellent uh, idea of starting this uh, training module type of webinars by the uh, newly elected our president of uh, uh, mox uh, dr suchit konkar fetal medicine committee and i wish all the success uh, to these kinds of webinars and any further webinars we are hosting along with other societies in future thank you so much i welcome now the chief guest of our webinar that is dr p k sha sir who is a past president of foxy he needs no introduction he is known as a bishma pitama of usg training programs he is the one who has started uh, the usg training program from foxy cn in cyan and because of him we as obstetricians are able to do the sonography thank you so much sir he is a professor and unit head in the km hospital he is the sir. president of foxy swati enough yes. enough enough okay sir okay thank you thank you sir so first of all let, let me thank the organizers of this uh, webinar especially the fetal medicine committee and the chairperson of fetal medicine committee of amox dr sujit konkar what is important is that chalis gaon obgyn society has partnered this program and it's so nice to see the president of uh, chalis gaon obgyn society dr yashwan bawar and the secretary mandar karambelkar who looks like a politician also it is so nice to see two experts in the form of dr ujwala and dr jayshree what is important is sujit has already said that it is very important for all the gynecologists to do ultrasound themselves you may not be able to diagnose everything maybe whenever you have doubt you can refer the patient to a sonologist a good reputed sonologist but basically i want each one of you to have an ultrasound machine and do at least basic ultrasonography that was the aim with which we started training way back in 88 and more than 700 foxy members have undergone training on behalf of foxy and i am very happy that many of them are practicing ultrasonography and not only that they are training now for their foxy members i was there for the last program sujit and it is so nice that you have picked up basic absolutely basics normal first trimester ultrasound abnormal first trimester ultrasound second trimester anomaly scan very important as sujit said nobody bothers we all talk about nasal bone and nt and all those things so and lastly the nt scan i think everybody is going to be given the academic fest today evening and i am sure you will all enjoy this webinar today thank you very much dr rajendra singh pardesi dr sujata and dr ajay mane the three newly elected office bearers president of amox dr rajendra who was my houseman at sian hospital once upon a time it is so nice to see people rising in front of you and doing such fantastic academic activity 
Sujata Ralvi again from KEM Hospital, and Ajay Mane, who has been elected as Vice President elect of Foxy. So it is so nice to have people around, and I would love to be a part of it whenever you call me because I enjoy watching people, talking people on ultrasonography. And it reminds me of my days when we used to teach. There is so much change now, metamorphosis, literally, if you ask me, in understanding of ultrasonography. So you must know this, the basics. Thank you very much. And Sujit, all the very best Thank you, sir. For, for, for your tenure. And I'm sure we'll be seeing each other more number of times and maybe sometimes physically. Thank you and all the best. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We are blessed you, to have you here. Okay. okay. I welcome uh, our guest of honor, Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardesi, sir, for a blessing speech. He's considered as a king of Aurangabad. It's okay. It's okay. Swati, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Just uh, my one bio data is sufficient. So, PK, sir, is my mentor. I'm disciple of Dr. <laughs> PK, sir. I think this is the only bio data. So, respected Dr. PK Shah, sir, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, Dr. Ajay Mane, our among chairperson, ever active and energetic chairperson, Dr. Sujit Konkar, and all colleagues. So, sir, just I wish to tell you all, sir has explained already ke how sonography is important. But I wish to tell you all because of some people. So, all have to remember Dr. P.K. Shah is one of them. Due to him only, now we can do sonography. In 2011, Medical Council of India has taken decision that any degree or diploma, DNB, DGO, or MD or MS in ob can do sonography, they need not to do training. So he is the person who was leading in this. So thank you, thank you so much, sir. And Pikesha is one person who has started training programs for Foxians. Nobody was giving training at that time. He is the person because I trained under him at that time only 1988-89. He has started the sonography training in Cyan Hospital, first training center. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. With the and Dr. Karambalekar and Dr. Yashwan Power, sir, they are very active in a small society and they are doing such a nice program. With the chairperson, Dr. Jayasri Jadav, Dr. Ujwala Devore, and the speakers, Dr. Konkar, Dr. Prathna Shah, and Dr. Sachin Nitite. I think this is going to be a great program. I wish every success to this program. And uh, MOC, Dr. Swati Pariyar, she is a very active member. And she only tells her, this is a, our webinar on sonography. Now I wish to anchor. So she is very active. Thank you, Dr. Swati. I wish to every success to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your kind words. I welcome Dr. Ajay Mane, sir, Vice President of Foxy Elect. Uh, he's considered as a backbone we, we, of... We, we, can, we can skip that. Okay, okay, sir. And okay, sir thank said, you. Welcome, yeah, sir. Nobody, nobody should the, show their biodata in front of PK, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Swati. Uh, it is very nice to see that my classmate and my very near and dear friend Sujit has started one great program, uh, which uh, uh, was a dream of P.K. Shah, sir, and he is fulfilling the dream, which was again a dream of Rajan Singh Pardish, sir, from our society, and he is fulfilling the dream, and we are supporters of him. So, uh, best luck, Sujit. And, uh, sir, uh, we have given you name of Bhishma Pitama, and uh, that suits you. You are the only person who is uh, having this uh, uh, nomenclature. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for being there for all of us. Uh, as sir said everything, and uh, all, I pay my regards to all respected members here on the dais of the dais. We have got very good attendance, 90, and it is adding on. So best luck, Sujit. So without wasting time, we can uh, go for the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. I welcome Dr. Ujwala Devre, ma'am, and Jaisri Dado, ma'am, as a chairperson of this session. I think we'll straightforward move to the session. I request Dr. Jayashri Zadho, madam, to introduce and invite Dr. Sujit Konkar for our first talk. Jesh, you're on mute, ma'am. It's okay now. Good afternoon, yes, one and all. Yes, 
I am obliged to be a part of this prestigious CME on UAG updates as a chairperson. And I'm hoping for more and more programs on ultrasound from the fetal medicine committee amongst. So today's first speaker is Dr. Sujit Konkar. Uh, he is a MBBS MD OBJY from GMC Aurangabad and practicing in Aurangabad since last 22 years. He had taken basic UAG training at uh, Dr. Bimal Sahani's Sonokan Center. He is a FMF certified for 11 to 13 week scans, preeclampsia screening, and Doppler and fetal abnormalities. His Sri Hospital is Foxy approved ultrasound training center and has trained many doctors up till now. Presently, he is a secretary of Society of Fetal Medicine, SFM, Marathwada chapter, and also a chairperson of Fetal Medicine Committee, AMOGS, and has special interest in advanced ultrasound. So today he will be topping, talking on ultrasound, features of early pregnancy, normal and abnormal. Uh, please, Dr. Sujit Konkar, you can start with your talk. Thank you, Dr. Jayasri, for uh, kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank our own AMOX and Chinese Gobbiji Society for giving me this opportunity. So the topic is early pregnancy, ultrasonography of normal and failed pregnancies. This is a very, very basic topic because most of the obstetricians they are having and they should have ultrasonography machine at their center. And what they do minimum is early pregnancy and follicular study. So knowledge regarding this early pregnancy and its complications is very, very important for a, a, a routine practice. So what are the goals of early first trimester scan? To confirm an intrauterine pregnancy and obviously to look for the features of extrauterine pregnancy. To date a pregnancy, this is important because Dating done in early pregnancy is much more accurate than dating done in later parts of gestation. To confirm number and viability of the feti, to assess chorionicity and amniocity in multiple pregnancies, to assess early fetal morphology and deviations from normal. This is a new concept in uh, imaging uh, in early pregnancy. Everyone should go uh, deeply through this. And to detect uterine anomalies like septate uterus or bicornal uterus and uh, any other maternal pelvic pathology because once the uterus is grown out of pelvis after 12, 14 weeks, these things are very difficult to catch. Many are worried about the safety of ultrasound in pregnancy. Ultrasound is quite safe, transvaginal 2D and even colorful mapping is safe, but fetal spectral Doppler is questionable. So whenever you need to measure fetal heart rate in early pregnancy, always go for M mode and don't use Doppler. Remember the Alara principle, that means as low as reasonably achievable. Here are some terms which needs to be cleared. We call it as an embryo till 10 weeks. After 10 weeks, it is called as fetus. Abortion refers to patient's choice of terminating a pregnancy and natural events are referred to as miscarriages. Blighted ohum, missed abortion, inevitable abortion. We have been using this for quite a long time, but now, now it is time to abandon these terms. So what are the correct terms? What are the appropriate terms? So this is a consensus statement from the ISHRI regarding the terminology for pregnancy loss prior to viability. And this is the table showing all the terms and their ultrasonographic description. I am not going to details of each and everything, but some important points I need to highlight here. Early miscarriage means when the intrauterine pregnancy loss less than 10 weeks on ultrasonography. And when it is more than 10 weeks, it is called as fetal miscarriage. When the intrauterine pregnancy loss with gestational sac, without yolk sac and embryo, we label it as an unembryonic miscarriage. And when there is yolk sac with, without embryo, it is called as yolk sac miscarriage. Embryonic miscarriage is term used when intrauterine pregnancy loss with an embryo without cardiac activity on ultrasonography. Again, more one more important is transvaginal sonography is the imaging modality of choice in evaluation of early pregnancy obviously because it has got the highest resolution. Initially, you can use convex or transabdominal probe to get an overview of the pelvis, but transvaginal sonography is the mainstay of early pregnancy imaging. Sonologists must be aware of normal and abnormal appearances of early pregnancy, 
and misunderstanding of normal anatomy and developmental milestones may lead to incorrect diagnosis and incorrect treatment, which is not acceptable. And one very important message I want to pass on here that transvaginal sonography does not cause miscarriage. We need to pass on this message to our patient because there is great myth or misconception regarding this. After ovulation and fertilization, the blastocyst enters in the uterine cavity at around four to fifth day. And after two days, it gets implanted into the decidua, giving a positive pregnancy test. And the journey starts here from ultra microscopic, microscopic structures we are barely visible on uh, uh, microscope and eyes to a series of C-shaped, these beautiful structures, which ends in this type of embryo. This is a five millimeter, eight weeks embryo. More precisely, these are the embryos from five weeks to 10 weeks. This is schematic representation. Now coming to imaging. Order of appearance of the stages in early pregnancy are very, very important. So the first to see, first to come is intradecidual sign. It is seen at 4.5 weeks. It is seen as a small two millimeter size uh, region. It is eccentric to the central ecogenic plane and has got thin ecogenic rim around. So this is a beautiful sagittal image of the uterus on transvaginal sonography. So we expect the gestational sac in the upper uterine cavity and to either side of the midline. The next to come is double decidual sex sign. Decidua is the endometrium of first trimester. This sign is seen at five weeks. It is seen as a rounded or oval fluid collection surrounded by two ecogenic rings. The outer ring is decidua and the inner ring is chorion. But there are some pitfalls. The pseudo sac, that is endometrial fluid collection, which is seen in around 25% of ecto pregnancy, can be mistaken for double decidual sex sign. But there are differences. This pseudo sac is elongated and centrally placed. It has got acute angles. It is teardrop shaped. And most importantly, it is a vascular. Small decidual cysts can be mistaken for small gestational sacs, but these are very well demarcated cysts in endometrium. And they usually do not abut the endometrial canal. And they do not have any ecogenic rim. Remember that these two signs, that is intradecidual sac sign and double decidual sac sign, these can be absent in 35% of pregnancies. Then comes the yolk sac. It is the first structure that is identified within the gestational sac. It is seen at five to 5.5 weeks, just three to five days prior to embryo. The positive predictive value of intrauterine pregnancy is 100% when we see the yolk sac into the sac. It is spherical in shape, ecogenic periphery and having translucent center. Occasionally it is seen as two parallel lines at one corner. The embryo is attached to this yolk sac by white line duct from which it get all nutrition. The normal diameter of yolk sac is two millimeter at six weeks and it is six millimeter at 10 weeks. At any time, the di yolk sac diameter should not be more than seven millimeter. And in a multiple pregnancy, the number of yolk sacs corresponds with the number of amnions. This is, uh, it looks on three dimensional. So yolk sacs in multiple pregnancy. So this first image is showing two yolk sacs. That means this is diamniotic pregnancy with clear lambda sign. This is diamniotic dichoronic pregnancy. Second image showing two amnions, two yolk sacs. That means this is diamniotic with a T sign. That is diamniotic monoclonal pregnancy. And third image showing two embryos, but only one uh, yolk sac. This is monoamniotic monoclonal pregnancy. One more important point to note here is that Yolk sac size is not a parameter for assessing the gestational age. Then fetal pole and cardiac positions. They are seen, seen at 6 to 6. Point. Embryo appears like a little dot on yolk sac. It is called as diamond ring sign. Cardiac activity may be seen as a flickering in this area. This is how it looks around 3D and uh, three-dimensional. Now last to come is amnion, which is seen at close to seven weeks. It is a thin membrane surrounding the embryo, which is thinner than yolk sac. See this one. Up to 10 weeks, the mean diameter of amnion is 10% larger than that of CRL. But after 10 weeks, the fetal urination starts and the amniotic cavity goes on expanding and the amnion fuses with the chorionate, chorionate around 14 to 16 weeks. The embryo is in the amniotic cavity, see here, and the yolk sac is in the extra embryonic silo. At seven to nine weeks, amnion is expanding. The yolk sac is free floating in coronary cavity, has continued growth and development progress. The embryo visibly changes from a dot to a grain of rice to a more kidney bean shaped structure. 
Embryonic morphology is better seen on three dimensional. This doesn't mean that you have to go for 3D in each and every patient. This is for just demonstration. This is the six weeks embryo already uh, demonstrated. The seven weeks embryo is L shaped. That means there is 90 degree angle between head and the body of uh, embryo. The umbilical cord is thicker and the limb birds are just emerging. The eight weeks embryo is open C shaped. The umbilical cord is uh, much thinner and limb birds are clearly seen. The nine weeks embryo, it has got very nice curvatures, curvature of abdomen and head. The limb birds are very well seen along with the um, elbow joints. And some, in some cases, you can see the slight physiological hernia at the umbilicus level. And this is the proper 10 weeks fetus. The embryo is renamed as fetus after 10 weeks. By the end of first trimester, organogenesis is complete and the amnion and chorion fuses at around 14 to 16 weeks. You must know the order of appearance in early pregnancy because any change in this can lead to non-viable abnormal pregnancy. First to come is intradecidual sac sign, then double decidual sac sign, then yolk sac, then fetal pole, then cardiac pulsations, and lastly, amnion. Coming to measurements in early pregnancy, there are three important measurements. One is mean sac diameter, then crown rump length, and then fetal heart rate. Mean sac diameter is the mean of three orthogonal planes. That means in sagittal plane, longitudinal diameter and anteroposterior diameter, and in transverse plane, the transfer diameter. The mean of these three is the mean sac diameter. In a normal healthy growing pregnancy, the rate of growth of gestation sac is at around one millimeter per day. And a very, very important message I want to give here is do not use mean sac diameter for dating of pregnancy. Use only CRL. This is very, very important measurement in early pregnancy, which is used in uh, uh, latter part of gestation for assessment of growth. This is the SO criteria given for the measurement of crown rump length. The fitness should be midline sagittal. The orientation should be horizontal. It should not be vertical or oblique. The magnification should be such that the full fetus or embryo occupies the whole screen. The position should be neutral. That means it should not be hyperflexed or hyperextended. There should be amniotic fluid between chin and chest. Endpoints should be clearly defined. That means your measurements are correct. ISOAG also states that between six to nine weeks, the embryo is hyperflexed. So you can use neck rump length instead of crown rump length in these cases. Now coming to fetal heart rate, as already told, whenever you need to measure fetal heart rate, always use M mode and don't use Doppler. Fetal heart rate is visible after the CRL two to four millimeter. As shown in this graph, in the earlier parts of pregnancy, the fetal heart rate is somewhat on the lower side. At eight weeks, it is 145 to 170 beats per minute. And after that, it plateaus down to 137 to 144 beats per minute. Here are some terms which uh, need to explain. In contrast to obstetrics, viability means which can result in a live one baby. That is more than 24 weeks. But surprisingly and confusingly, when we are talking of early pregnancy scan, only two things are important to uh, confirm this. That is, one is demonstration of intrauterine pregnancy, and second is demonstration of fetal cardiac activity. How much is sufficient to label as viable pregnancy? Non-viable pregnancies which cannot result in live one baby, and intrauterine pregnancy of uncertain viability comes under the gray zone. Miscarriage is defined as spontaneous loss of pregnancy before it would be able to survive independently. So the fundamental principle is first do no harm. Misdiagnosis of failed pregnancy, it should not be accepted. It should be taken as crime because it may lead to inadvertent termination of a potential viable pregnancy. So there are strict cutoffs are available for diagnosis of failed pregnancy. Strict time intervals are there for repeated scans if initial scan is inconclusive. There is no hurry in waiting for few more days to come to the diagnosis of failed pregnancy. So the basic thing is first do no harm. Now coming to Ultrasonography science of early pregnancy failure. This is a very nice article by Peter Dowlett, Diagnostic Criteria for non viable Pregnancy Early in First Trimester. This is called as Peter Dowlett Criteria also. So some are definite signs. That means the positive predictive value of failed pregnancy is 100% in these cases. Some are worrisome signs. You need to pay attention to them, but do not rely on that. Some are less predictive. They are hard to apply. They can be associated. Definite signs are CRL-based mean sac diameter based and time based criteria. In CRL based criteria, when you have got the embryo with uh, CRL seven millimeter or more, 
without any cardiac activity, then straight away you can label it as a failed pregnancy. The previous criteria was five millimeter, but it has been changed uh, recently. The positive probability value for pregnancy failure is 100% when the CRL is more than seven millimeter without any cardiac activity. The CRL less than seven millimeter without cardiac activity is mostly demise, but you should call the patient for follow up. It is very important to be sure that you are imaging embryo and nothing else. Two things here can be mistaken for embryo. First one is lobular wall of gestation sac and second is coronic bump. This is a very nice image of coronic bump. Uh, new sonologist may mistaken, mistake this as uh, embryo, uh, measure it as, uh, as per serial norms and put M mode for measurement of fetal heart rate. Obviously there is no cardiac activity. So this can be labeled as miscarriage. These things should be avoided. And coming to mean sac based criteria, when the uh, mean sac diameter is 25 millimeter or more without any yolk sac or embryo, straight way you can label it as a failed pregnancy. The positive predictive value for early pregnancy failure is 100% in these cases. The old rule was 20 millimeter, but recently it has been changed. The mean sac diameter between 16 to 24 without yolk sac or without embryo is suspicious, but not diagnostic. We need to organize follow up scans. Again, there is a new evidence. When the patient is having very regular cycles and more than seven days after LMP, if mean sac diameter is 18 millimeter without embryo and round rump length is three millimeter without fetal heart activity, straight away you can label it as miscarriage in one sitting. Remember that all this applies when you are using transvaginal sonography. If because of any reason you are not able to use transvaginal sonography, you, you are using uh, transabdominal sonography, then call the patient after 14 days for reassessment. Now coming to time-based criteria, CRL and mean sac diameter-based criteria, they are single scan. That means in a single sitting, you are giving the diagnosis of failed pregnancy to the patient without any follow-ups. But there are some pregnancies which do not reach the milestones of CRL 7 millimeter or mean sac diameter 25 millimeter. So this time-based criteria is for those patients. So when the initial scan shows gestational sac without yolk sac and embryo, call the patient after 15 days. And if the initial scan shows yolk sac but no embryo, Call the patient after 11 days for follow-up. And even after in follow-up scans, you don't get embryo with cardiac activity. You can label them as a failed pregnancy. Now coming to suspicious findings. These are gray zone parameters, small sac size, empty amnion sign, embryonic bradycardia, and expanded amnion sign. Gray zone parameters, which are the below the cutoff levels, that is absent cardiac activity below cutoff CRL 7 millimeter, and mean sac diameter 16 to 24 millimeter without identified embryo. Here, the time-based criteria is less than required. We should organize follow-up scans for confirmation of the diagnosis. Small sac size or oligoamniotic sac. Normally, gestational sac is considered larger than embryo. By and large, it is said that if you are able to fit one more embryo into that gestational sac, that is the normal gestational sac size roughly. When the difference between mean sac diameter and crown rump length is less than five millimeter, it is labeled as oligoamniotic sac, but this is not a definite sign. Still follow-up is required in these cases. And after follow-up, you can confirm the diagnosis. Normal order of appearance is gestation sac, then yolk sac, then embryo, and then amnion. In empty amnion sign, the amnion is seen, but there is no embryo, which is abnormal, which carries a poor prognosis. Remember that this could be mistaken for two yolk sacs in monoamniotic monochronic twins. So, Follow-up is very, very important in these cases also. Embryonic bradycardia is associated with poor outcome. Severe bradycardia is, associ is associated with less than 1% survival rate. Here, the embryonic cardiac activity is normally seen before amnion is seen. In expanded amnion sign, there is visualization of embryo that is surrounded by amnion, but it has not got any cardiac activity. Here are some yolk sac abnormalities. The first image is showing no yolk sac. That means you can't see any yolk sac here. Second image is showing large yolk sac. This is almost nine to 10 millimeter yolk sac. And third image is showing the calcified yolk sac. All these can be associated with poor pregnancy outcome. But remember that these can be associated with good outcome too. So you must give a follow-up scan in these patients for confirmation of diagnosis information of good pregnancy or failed pregnancy. Irregular shape of gestation sac is also associated with abnormal fetal outcome. 
सब कर रहे हैं स्मॉल हेमेटोमास आर वेरी वेरी कॉमन मेनी टाइम्स यू डोंट रिपोर्ट इट ऑल्सो बट यस इफ द हिमेटोमा इज लार्ज इफ इट इज कवरिंग मोर देन टू थर्ड कॉन्फ्रेंस सरकम फ्रेंस ऑफ दैक एंड जेस्टेशनल एज इज लेस देन एट वीक्स देन इट इज वेरी सम कॉल द पेशेंट फॉर फॉलो अप अगेन दिस इज अनदर साइन यू कैन सी दिस द इकोजेनिक लाइन्स स्ट्रैंड इन द एक्सट्रेम रेवनिक सिलो सी हियर यू कैन सी इन ऑल दिस फोर इमेजेस दिस इज एसोसिएटेड विथ poor fetal outcome now coming to ectopic pregnancy we are not going to the detail of theoretical part we are going just to look at the imaging part and all of us know 95% of the ectopic subtubal out of his 70% are ampullary so uh, you see the blob sign in 60% of cases bezel sign in 20% of cases and in rest 20% of cases there is straight forward diagnosis that means you get uh, gestational sac with fetal fold in adnex so this is a blob sign so this is the ovary and this is the inhomogeneous adnexal mass in uh, in uh, addition to ovary but it is very important note to remember that these two are not one these two are separate sliding sign is positive here that means with the help of transvaginal probe you should be able to slide this along uh, apart from this this is seen in 60% of cases of ectopic pregnancy this is bezel sign this is the ovary and uh, beside this this is the in homogeneous adnexal mass with a gestational sac inside it this is seen in 20% of cases in this cases in this type of cases the life is very much easy diagnosis is clear this is ovary and in adnex uh, near to ovary you uh, have this lesion with yolk sac and fetal pole this is hemoperitoneum the amount of hemoperitoneum depend on the severity of bleeding anything going beyond poch of douglas is supposed to be the severe type of hemoperitoneum this is a list of non tubal ectopics interstitial pregnancy cervical pregnancy ovarian pregnancy pregnancy in rudimentary horn ectopic after hysterectomy all this is beyond the scope of this talk but i want to mention these two uh, things one is scar ectopic so there are four important signs of scar ectopics are empty uterine cavity empty cervical cavity the implantation of gestational sac in the anteriorly in the scar region and very much thin in uh, myometrium at this point remember that whenever you are uh, looking at gestational sac in early pregnancy please pay heed to these time things because this is the precursor of pas this is placenta acuta spectrum disorders so if you are diagnosing this quite early you are diagnosing pas very very early and indirectly you are saving one patient one life another is heterotopic pregnancy that means concurrent occurrence of pregnancy intrauterine as well as extrauterine in natural pregnancies the incidence is 1 in 30000 but in art clinics it is 1 in 4000 and if you are transferring more than 5 6 embryos then the incidence is much higher so if you are imaging in busy art clinic you have to very very careful looking into adnexa to catch up these things so coming to mole complete mole these are the result of fertilization of an empty ovum that is egg nucleated ovum by uh, sperms the cells are diploid so the karyotype cary- The genetic information is only paternal. The ultrasound of the carrier is very very simple, very very peculiar. That is called a snowstorm appearance or a bunch of grape appearance. The detection rate is almost hundred percent. While partial moles are because of fertilization of a normal ovum. So the karyotype uh, is diploid here, and we have got some fetal tissue here. So the pick up rate is less, twenty to twenty five percent cases, and many of the times it is diagnosed on histopathological when the POCs are sent for examination. Now coming to last part, you have to think beyond cardiac activity, dating, and number of fetuses. Tune your mind to the embryonic morphology. With advent of newer hand machines and high frequency transvaginal probe, you can be able to diagnose many things at nine to ten weeks, like acrania, holoprosen kefali, ventricular megaly. body stroke anomaly and so on this is a very nice article sonographic detection of fetal abnormalities before 11 weeks of gestation look is nuclear translucency a useful aneuploidy marker in fetuses with crown rump length 28 to 44 the percentile charts are available for uh, nuclear translucency ranging from 28 crl to 44 so the researches are going in this area so we have to look in this area also now last part take home message you must remember the chronology of appearance because any disturbance in that may lead to a non viable pregnancy transvaginal sonography is the modality of choice when you are imaging early pregnancy 
Don't jump to diagnosis of failed pregnancy. Give adequate follow up in doubtful cases. And you must think beyond cardiac activity, dating, and number of fetuses. Look at the morphology. You may diagnose many, many things at nine to ten weeks of gestation. Thank you for being online. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit sir, for a wonderful presentation. I request Dr. Ujwara Devre, madam, to give expert opinion and remark on this topic. I would like to first thanks. Hello. I would like to first thanks the uh, Amos committee to be. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like to first thanks uh, Amos uh, Dr. Raja, Amos President Dr. Rajendra Pardesi, uh, who uh, made me a, a, part, a part of this webinar, and uh, Dr. P. K. Shah sir, and uh, just. Uh, telling that uh, Sujit Konkar, uh, you have elaborated the whole topic in very simple and uh, easy manner that uh, you have done uh, the difference between the normal and abnormal pregnancy, that is failed pregnancy, very nicely, so that uh, one, one can deal with how to differentiate between the, this uh, failed pregnancy in early cases. Thanks to Dr. Sujit Kumar. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions from the audience? I request Dr. Ujwala Devere, ma'am, to introduce Dr. Prarthana Shah to talk on second lecture. Good evening, uh, Dr. Prathana Deshpande. She is MBBS, TNB, and FMM. She is consultant of maternal fetal medicine at Cape Town Hospital, Aurangabad. She is specializing high risk obstetric and fetal medicine. She does his ten years of experience in this field. Has presented papers and posters in state and national conferences. She worked at various prestigious institutes at Bangalore, Mumbai, and Pune. She was the first maternal fetal medicine expert of Maharashtra, now working for more than five years in Aurangabad. She has successfully completed 500 fetal invasive procedures, including intrauterine fetal transfusions in Aurangabad. Uh, I welcome Dr. Prathana Shah, madam, to take uh, give her. At the outset, I would like, uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, at the outset, I would like to thank our own uh, Dr. Pradeshi sir. Now, like, Amongst is our home now, and uh, Amongst Fetal Medicine Committee chairperson is also our, at our home now, Dr. Amos Sujit Kunkar sir. Both of you, thanks for giving me this opportunity, and Child Gava Vijaya Society for inviting me again for delivering a lecture for our Child Gava Vijaya people. So, my topic is um, actually easy but a bit lengthy so i hope uh, you people will bear with me it may extend the time is my uh, are my slides seen yes ma'am yes thank you because uh, uh, soft markers whenever we talk about soft markers there is really lot to talk about and there are a lot of misunderstandings too so uh, let us start as what we are going to expect from this this topic today the outline is so that what exactly are soft markers, why are we looking for them, what to do if we find the soft markers, and what additional information can we gain from these soft markers. Basically, soft markers are minor ultrasound findings, which are normal variants, but they tend to have association of an increased aneuploid risk. That's why these are important for us. If we look back in the history, uh, these various soft markers questions, uh, why were they raised was they were in introduced to improve the detection of trisomy 21 over the achievable age-based risk and additional to the serum screening strategies. But the relative importance of these have shifted. Now, they are not only looking at aneuploidies, but with other genetic problems also. And not only this, other structural possible outcomes can be altered if we find these anomalies in the anomaly scheme. 
so not only this information but along with that what they bring in is anxiety a lot of anxiety in the families lots of lot of anxiety in the doctors as well. if i see this in the ultrasonography report what exactly i should interpret the tension is for family is what is going to be uh, going to happen with my baby is there anything major wrong with my child if they read these findings in the anomaly scan report so let us solve this now we should always remember that the screening is for possible genetic and or structural pathologies also so we are not looking only at aneuploidies as we used to when we begin with these soft markers but now we are looking for other conditions also so let us understand the concept of screening first whenever we have a population of 100 women and we want to look for something in them if we apply a general population we know the general incidence of any condition is so and so for example for down syndrome the general population incidence is 1 in 600 when we add a uh, age factor that suppose now she is about 35 years about 40 years we know the incidence increases from 1 in 600 to around 3 per 10 and when we add a screening method whether it is sonography whether it is soft marker or whether it is series in any serum screening method we tend to pick up more and more women with these conditions and that's why the screening methods are important for us if we look at second trimester screening we have two options one is a sonography that is what we call as tpa scan and the second is a quadruple marker i'm not going to talk at all about quadruple marker today so the strategy whenever we think about screening should always be a screening method whenever for required should be followed by a diagnosis we should never lead only to screening we should complete the procedure with the diagnosis this is very important so whenever we talk about any genetic conditions including aneuploidies the risk should be evaluated on the basis of various combinations in which we have the a priori risk which i'm going to discuss further as age of the mother prior affected pregnancies or any family histories biochemical screening if it is done in first trimester especially ultrasound that is either nt scan or our anomaly scan and newer test like cf dna whether they were done earlier in the pregnancy criteria to select a screening test should always be based on this and not based on what the companies talk to us about out of this what is important for us is the likelihood ratio the lr value is what is important for us whenever we look at various soft markers what exactly is a marker is a marker is a finding which has some predictive value and the predictive value for each marker is termed as likelihood ratio so as a soft marker has a different predictive value the likelihood ratio of each marker will be different if we look at various markers for trisomy 21 this is a big list of markers trisomy 13 this is another list trisomy 18 this is list so out of this what exactly is important for us and what we are going to discuss these are the markers that i have shortlisted for today's talk because these are the importance which have been given particular likelihood ratios and that's why they are important for us to calculate the further risk one important term is to understand a false positive ratio that means we get a soft marker but that doesn't mean this is is present so disease can be absent but we are getting a soft marker that is a false positive ratio for that particular marker so what to do when we get a soft marker are we going to get panic oh i got a correct plexus this now what to do no the today's talk is going to take us to understand these markers in a better way if we look at this article of 2019 way back they had studied that if a cup family is given a report of correct plexus this what happened whether it is for betterment or for worse and they found that unless a proper counseling is done this is not going to give a peaceful mind for the families so this is very important for us to understand as what exactly will we are going to talk with the family as i discussed earlier for any genetic conditions especially aneuploidies a prior risk is based on the age of the mother as we can see in this graph as the age of the mother is going to increase from 20 to 45 the possibility of the condition to be there in the fetus is going to increase but if we compare it to the gestational age at the gestational age is going to advance the possibility of live pregnancy is going to decrease because we know that these tend pregnancies tend to miscarry earlier in the first or second trimester this is way back when benasser of allotted different markers as different scoring indexes followed by we got nyberg who gave these likelihood ratios and then again nicoloids also shortlisted these markers but these are not the ones now we are using we have got newer markers with better likelihood ratios based on newer identification techniques now if we have seen a soft marker what exactly we are going to do 
very important is we should start looking for other findings this is very important because if this marker is isolated the significance and the final risk calculation will vary as compared to when it is going to be in combination with other findings now very important what exactly is isolated soft marker many a number of times i get call from gynecologist saying that madam there is this finding and then i ask the question whether it is isolated finding or there is anything else and then there is a pause as what exactly i am asking them so isolated means a soft marker that has been identified in absence of any fetal structural anomaly growth restriction or additional or other soft marker so only one finding this particular soft marker is seen then we call it is isolated which has its own likelihood ratio but if it com comes in along with other markers the likelihood ratio of all these markers need to be taken into account so this is very important for us to understand so let us see what these individual markers trying to tell us let us start with the short long bones we quite frequently get these report that the humerus or femur is short not only humerus and femur other long bones also can be shown so the by definition the value is when the length falls below 5 percentile this is very important because we come across many a sonography reports where the percentile figure for any biometric parameter is not given bpd hc ac nfl these are the ones that we commonly major and what we see is this particular parameter is this much centimeter in length or diameter and the weeks corresponding to it but that is not enough for us to have these identification we need to put them as percentile figures this is very important for us to calculate various parameters including definition of short long bones the incidence of general short long bones is around 5% but if you look at the likelihood ratio for short humor is this is 0.78 and for short femur it is 0.61 so a short humerus carries more weightage as compared to short femur now how to measure we all know it should always be measured the bone should be located horizontally or if we measure it vertically then we can get falsely short length also we can compare it with the bpd for that particular gestational age so this is very important the short long bones are not only associated with aneuploidy syndromes like downs which has a 9% sensitivity but also non aneuploidy conditions like fetal skeletal dysplasia and not only genetic if we look at the structural or the functional part of it later these babies who are genetically normal can develop fetal growth restrictions later in the second or third trimester so how to prognosticate is whenever we get a short long bone we should look for limb dysplasia and other findings for potential genetic conditions we should advise amniocentesis to rule out aneuploidies and the skeletal dysplasia and if these are normal then we should still follow up in the second and third trimester for evolving changes in the growth of the fetus this is one nice article from arch of gynecology to on january 2021 where they have suggested whenever we have short long bones a karyotype is not adequate we need to evaluate the fetus with a microarray because that will cover other conditions also so karyotype is only for aneuploidies here we, we are talking not only about aneuploidies but other related genetic, genetic conditions also what about nasal bone as we can see in this image itself a racial variation itself has its own impact on the nasal bone length so we should have a measuring technique which is done properly what is it by definition if at 16 weeks we are trying to measure a nasal bone it is below than 3 mm and at 20 weeks less than 4.5 mm we call it as a hypoplastic nasal bone this is very important to understand that we are talking about a nasal bone length if we want to explain this to our patients we should never say that the nasal bone is absent marathi sangaycha tar baalacha nak nahi hai asa aplya tondun chukun ki nahi jayla pahije because i have seen in number of pregnancies being terminated with the fear of this in mind that there is no nose to my baby or my baby may need a plastic surgery so we i can't take that risk that is absolutely not the meaning of hypoplastic nasal bone hypoplastic nasal bone means only the shortening of the length first thing secondly secondly a short nasal bone length will not have any effect on the quality of the life of the baby what is important here is the association of this conditions with the genetic problems so if they are present then the prognosis is going to be poor but if we are ruling out genetic associations then the prognosis is going to be good even if we get the same sonography report throughout 9 month that yes the nasal bone is, is still hypoplastic 
If you look at epidemiology, general fetal in normal fetuses, around one to two percent of the babies can have hypoplastic nasal bone, but up to sixty-two percent of the fetuses of Down syndrome will have an absent nasal bone. If you look at the image, there is an ideal way to take it. It should always be in mid sagittal section, and angle of insertion should be forty-five to one thirty-five degrees. Let us look at the aneuploidy associations for Down syndrome. The likelihood ratio for this particular marker is six point five eight, which is a really big figure. Not only trisomy twenty-one, but even thirteen, eighteen, and trisomy syndrome can have hypoplastic nasal syndrome. Not only aneuploidy is again here. We have facial dysmorphisms with various clinically significant CNBs can present with hypoplastic nasal bone, and fetal warfarin syndrome can also have this feature. So, if you look at the first article of September 2015, they have stressed that yes, whenever we have hypoplastic nasal bone in second trimester, it is a significant marker. So, uh, invasive testing should be advised, even if it is isolated. The second article of January 2019 insists that in case of hypoplastic nasal syndrome, we should never stop only at carrier type or by ruling out aneuploidies. We should always offer a microarray to such fetuses. Now let us look at third marker that is nuchal fold thickening. Nuchal fold thickening is different from nuchal translucency that we measure in the first trimester. Nuchal translucency has itself has a really great significance. But as we know, many of our patients tend to consult us after 13 or 14 weeks of pregnancy when we have missed the window of nuchal translucency measurement. So in such babies, nuchal fold thickening itself is a really good marker. It 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 means a redundant skin fold or a excess soft tissue in the posterior neck area. This is from Latin word which said nuca means the posterior of the neck. Can be differentiated from cystic hygroma by lack of fluid filled loculations which are commonly seen. If we look at the sensitivity of this marker, it is around seventy up to seventy five percent of the babies can have increased nuchal translucency, and again the likelihood ratio is really good three point seven nine for this marker. What are the possible etiologies? Are two. One is hydrops, which is going to evolve, evolve further, and the lymphatic obstruction can present as increased lymphatic fluid thickening. What are the associations? Not only aneuploidies, again various single gene disorders. Thirteen, eighteen are there, but also Klippel-Feil syndrome, Zellweger syndrome can, and there are many more conditions which can present with this condition. And even congenital heart disease patients, uh, fetuses tend to present with this condition. If you look at the image, it should always be looked through the transaxial plane. That we look for the posterior fossa structures like cerebellum and posterior occipital bone, and it should be a out-to-out measurement from the skin fold to the occipital bone. Now, aberrant right subclavian artery. This is a relatively newer marker, but really has taken its good place in screening for aneuploidies. It's a rare anomaly of the Right subclavian artery, where instead of aortic arch, it arises from the back. Where it normally originates from back of the pelvic artery, this originates from the descending aorta. It's the most common congenital anomaly of the aortic arch. As you can see in the figure, that is the normal origin of the right subclavian artery from the back of the pelvic artery. But in case of aberrant right subclavian artery, it is arising from the descending part of aorta and going behind it. Now, again, per se, presence of ursa will not affect the fetal outcome. It is not going to affect the structural functional working of the fetal heart, but its in association is the one which that matters. If we look at chromosomally normal fetuses, one point up to one point five percent of the babies can have ursa. But in Down syndrome, it can increase up to 37 percent, and again, this marker has a really good likelihood ratio of around 3.94. Now, if you can see in the image, this is not very clearly seen, but the T is a trachea. The normal course of the right subclavian artery should be anterior to the trachea. Sorry, but in case of aberrant course, instead of going from the anterior aspect of trachea, it is turning around and going from the posterior aspect of trachea. That's how we can pick up even in the First trimester. So, if we see that, the, as per this article of UOG 2010, up to 29 percent of the babies have with Down's tend to present with ursa. Not only Down's, but other intracardiac anomalies also are associated with ursa. So, when we look at ursa, we are looking for the cardiac evaluation in more detail. Now, if we look at this article of again 2021. So they are not talking only about women with advanced age and uh, ARSA, but even in a general population, whenever we get ARSA, it is considered as a major marker, and we do offer amniocentesis to such women. Now, carotid plexus. Again, this is a very, very commonly seen finding. It's a benign and often transient type of cyst. 
It results in neutro from infolding of the neuroepithelium. Now, the estimated occurrence is around 1%, but one third of babies with trisomy 18 present with this finding. It is typically seen at the level of atria involving the lateral ventricle. Very importantly, vast majority of these cases do not have associated abnormality. The common association with trisomy 18 is seen in up to 50% of babies with trisomy 18 present with this, but others like Linfelton and Icardi can also present with this finding. Now, when we see in the second trimester, what we see are the sonolucent cysts, particularly about the lateral ventricles. The size and numbers are thought to affect the risk by some authors, but by many of the authors, it has been rejected that if we get instead of unilateral bilateral choroid plexus cyst, will it increase the risk? It is not so. Now, this is the image which is showing nicely equalucent walls also, but very important is if no other anomalies are found, especially when we look at the hand, we can see open hands and if we can see that ear length is normal, these two are very important markers for trisomy 80. So if we find that these two findings are normal, then based only on choroid plexus, the possibility even in a high risk population, possibility of trisomy 18 is very less. So amniocentesis or invasive testing is not at all recommended if it is an isolated finding. Majority of these cysts tend to disappear by third trimester, so there is no need of CT scan after birth in such babies. There is some cyst in the brain, so after delivery you have to do some CT scan MRI of the brain. Absolutely not, not at all required because it is not associated with abnormal CNS development. Now, ecogenic intracardiac focus, what we call as gold balls in the heart of the um, uh, fetus. These are discrete and brightly ecogenic spots with brightness similar to the bone. This is very important. And these are caused by the reflection of the papillary muscles and the body tendony. In 5% of the karyotypically normal fetuses, we can see this finding. And in Asian population, this tends to be seen commonly. These represent the mineralization of the papillary muscle. More commonly, they are seen in the left ventricle as compared to right ventricle. If we can see here in the image, nicely we can see these nice bright spots. The, where we can call the equation it is similar to bone. But that is very important that we have to change the angle and confirm that in different views we are still able to see this finding because in subcostal views they may tend to disappear. If we are not able to see them in two different views, then that is not confirmatory of this finding. So very important is whenever we see it as isolated, there is no further evaluation at all required in this fetus. Isolated ecogenic intracardiac focus is, has a very less likelihood ratio, so no further investigations are required. But second important part is no recognized direct association with congenital disease. So if I have seen ecogenic intracardiac focus at 18 weeks, do I have to advise fetal echo? If it is isolated finding, there is no need of fetal echo further in the pregnancy also. This is a nice consult by SFM, uh, S um, Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, along with the uh, ACOG in October 2021, where we know that there is no negative, uh, there is a negative screening result. That means first trimester or a second trimester and isolated finding. We recommend no further evaluation with indication of fetal echo, follow up ultrasound, or postnatal. None of these are required if it is an isolated finding. Ecogenic bowel, where again it appears the bowel appears to be brighter and it is supposed to be. Incidence in normal population can be up to 1.8%, but in Downs isolated again only 1.4%. The cause of this is not certain, but can be because of intramniotic hemorrhage. This is again very important for us to understand. Whenever we see this finding in the ultrasound, the first question to the mother should be any history of threatened abortion in the first trimester. Because whenever there is a history of threatened abortion, the hemorrhage that has taken place externally also has occurred in the uterine cavity. The presence of this blood in the amniotic fluid which was swallowed by the fetus is being seen as ecogenic bowel. So that should always be our first differential diagnosis whenever we see ecogenic bowel and not aneuploidies. In the third trimester, if we see ecogenic bowel, it can be because of the meconium which has been a bit of dehydrated and that's why it is being appearing brightly. It is normally seen in the right lower quadrant of the fetus. Again, it is isolated finding in up to 70% of the cases. And the second common cause of this should be after the threatened abortion should be intrauterine infection. In case of intrauterine infections, we can see this uh, ecogenic bowel, especially in CMV patients. 
in babies with intrauterine growth restriction we can see this in cystic fibrosis yes we have to look for cystic fibrosis when we see this condition and not any bodies and again other trisomies which we as earlier stated are not isolated findings very important that in 1% of normal pregnancies we can see the bowel as ecogenic okay but normally the bowel is grey and the bone is white so if we see bowel as white then we call it as a ecogenic bowel now as you can see here in this image we always compare the brightness of this bowel to that of the bone so if we are seeing that they are both equally ecogenic then only we call it the most common problem is the use of the transducer if you are using higher frequency transducer we can get false positive high ecogenic bowels now this is one finding i'm going to talk a bit in detail because this is not only in terms of uh, aneuploidy screening but in terms of later on second and third trimester outcomes so whenever i see a prominent renal pelvis we call it as a renal pelvitis which is a mild end of the fetal hydronephrosis syndrome and that's why it has importance it is a male prediction and around 2% of the scans we can see it first important is physiological it is because of maternal high dehydration or over hydration we can see these changes can be because of fetal pathology structural defects like fetal pug obstruction fetal vasco urethral junction obstruction urethral obstructions obstruction like posterior walls vasco urethral reflexes in duplex kidney so when we get this finding we have to follow them for these condition follow the fetuses for these conditions this is the way how we going to calculate it should always be in axial plane with the ap dimension of the fluid filled renal pelvis kidney should and spine are position either directly towards or away from the transducers the common at uh, measurement at around 18 to 20 we should be 4 to 4.5 and in the third trimester if it is more than 7 mm we call it as a increase right association again with trisomy 21 is very weak so the risk is not enough to justify amniocentesis in a low risk population in 96% of the babies this pelvitis tends to resolve by the second trimester or early in the postnatal period risk of postnatal renal pathology is increased whenever we are seeing that throughout the pregnancy with monitoring we are seeing the degree of pelvic dilatation is increasing there is in utero progression of the pathology with the cortical involvement bilateral involvement and antenatally detected renal pelvic dilatation especially in isolation is considered a weak reflex for vasco urethric reflux so we advise them the postnatal sonography evaluation in a repeat scan at 30 to 40 weeks in which patients we advise this if we see that around 28 weeks we have seen a 6 mm of dilatation in these babies we advise a repeat scan at 30 to 40 weeks and in postnatal cases most of these resolve spontaneously in the first year of life and invasive procedures will not be needed in these babies these values that's why are important 6 mm less likely very rarely that these babies will need any surgical intervention with fetuses isolated dilatation of stage a1 evaluation about 32 weeks is required and that will guide whether postnatal invasion is required with those fetuses in stage a2 to a3 we recommend individualized follow up depending on what findings we are getting as per again smfm consult series of october 2021 now we let us look at fetal ventricular megaly which is referring to the dilatation of cerebral ventricles in utero can be seen up to 9.9% per, of all pregnancies slightly increased male prediction and the likelihood ratio is very important 3.8 for trisomy 21 that's why it is an important marker it is because of the development of lateral ventricle at the end of first ventri- uh, trimester what happens is normally the cord plexus is fill lateral ventricles but in the second trimester what happens is they tend to recede posteriorly and we should be able to see a lateral cerebral ventricle which is ra- large relative to the cerebral hemispheric bid what are the common etiology of ventricular megaly various cns structural anomalies like dandy walker chiari 2 aqueduct stenosis or genesis of corpus callosum various in utero infections can present so whenever we are talking about amnio we are thinking about in intro infection evaluation also like toxoplasma and cmv and other trisomies and uh, like 18 and 13 various congenital syndromes are associated with ventricular megaly 
if we look at radiography if we can measure a ventricular width more than 10 mm this is very important there are various definitions mild ventricular megaly moderate to severe or mild and severe whenever we get a figure between 10 to 15 we call it as a mild whenever it is crossing a figure of 15 we call it as a severe now whenever we get a ventricular width of less than 10 mm if it is 9 if it is 8 it is a normal ventricular width this particular value of less than 10 doesn't require any further evaluation a prominent lateral ventricle is not a finding to be mentioned if the width is less than 10 mm this is very important because i can uh, you know proudly say that i have saved so many babies coming with a lateral ventricular width of 9 mm and the parents just before going for termination had a just you know chit chatting with me and i could counsel that 9 is a normal please wait and they continued pregnancy and now they have two three four year old kids we are happy and normal so they came back to me madam because you told we could continue this is very important cut off of 10 means cut off of 10 less than 10 is normal but yes now it is crossing 10 then you take the further call as we can see in this image this is around 10 to 12 whereas here you can see 13 to 15 mm So let us revise with various markers. We have found a marker. We have a nice calculator now, the Marcellona calculator, which we can download in our systems, and we can enter these figures for the likelihood ratio calculations, and it just gives you a final calculation risk. Just to revise the likelihood ratio that we have discussed earlier individually, as I have put them in red. These are the important markers. so whenever see they then even as isolated we have to advise the further genetic evaluation to the family as per this article of 2013 so we have a marker isolated markers which are important in themselves are these so we can discuss option of amniocentesis for further genetic evaluation these are very very less likely to ratio markers so unless they are combined with either other soft markers or major markers we need to sit counsel and follow like pilot assess it's not for aneuploidy but yes needs follow ecogenic bowel not only for aneuploidy but cystic fibrosis is a possibility so we have to think about that right so this is very important while identification of one or markers one or more markers is effective screening tool the actual computed risk is only an approximation so we cannot say that okay now this is your risk so just relax and sit back no we need to sit down and counsel this is very important to tell them last week itself i had a patient who had a first trimester combined risk of intermediate she was just offered an ipt she underwent even ipt which came as low risk and then she was some reason came to me and then she was told that after rapid was low risk go ahead for amniocentesis and she was confused so she came to me so i told her what is the difference between rapid and amniocentesis this is 100% and diagnostic amniocentesis and 99% sensitive specificity of rapid for trisomy 21 then she is like no one discuss this with me if i would have been offered rapid versus amnio i would have gone for amnio only but now with rapid in my hand what to do i'm confused whether still i have to go for amnio or not so whenever we are offering counseling is very important so let us complete talk with the modality of diagnosis in second trimester we all know that amniocentesis should be the modality of diagnosis we can do it as early as 16 weeks so if we have any doubt in the first trimester let us start with the early normal scan at 16 weeks and take the first call further from there we know that advantages and disadvantages are different now this is again important we have collected the amniotic fluid what which test to offer fish your pcr karyotype as microarray as i discussed with various studies and various soft markers they are insisting more on microarray as compared to only karyotype because of various single gene disorders can be associated with these markers also so finishing only with fish let us do only fish your trisomy 21 risk is ruled out relax there is no further revision needed this will not suffice just trying to cut down the cost by offering less number of tests are not going to help the patient let us sit with them explain them why microarray will be required in majority of these markers and the patients really do understand when we talk to them so the take home message here will be universal screening at proper gestational age now let us not do the anomaly scan at 22 weeks because we have been given the 24 weeks window now the presence of marker increases and the absence of marker decreases the risk of aneuploidies the final risk calculation to be discussed with the couple only diagnostic testing this is important diagnostic testing removes residual risk for aneuploidy and not screening test 
in close follow up of, of some patients even if the genetic reports are normal thank you all for your patience thank you ma'am for the excellent presentation uh dr mahendra has asked few words about nipt you have already explained actually so will you suggest some people that uh, you should go for nipt or you will always give a option of amniocentesis to everyone whenever we talk about uh, uh, nipt first thing is we should understand the sole and the only indication for nipt should be uh, intermediate risk in the first trimester combined screening because NIPT is for trisomy 21. The 99% sensitivity and specificity is for trisomy 21. If we want to talk about trisomy 13 and 18, as I discussed, these two conditions tend to manifest with different structural anomalies. They tend to manifest. They never come as no anomalies, no soft markers are seen, and there is trisomy 18 or 13 in the child. So now, when we are talking about trisomy 21 only, then where it fits NIPT? this is very important if you are suspecting only trisomy 21 then that is in intermediate risk not in high risk woman because the high risk report comes with majority of the cases with a low pap a and the low pap a never talks only about trisomy 21 it talks about various other genetic conditions it talks about placental pathologies so why to advise only nipt in sit there that is first part second part is we should tell them that nipt again is a screening test whereas amniocentesis is a diagnostic which was a part of one line of my take home message that if we want to take out the residual risk if we want the if the couple wants 100% assurance there is no genetic problem then the only answer is amniocentesis let the couple take the call whether they want to be satisfied with 99% risk the uh, 99% sensitivity or specificity or they want 100% assurance let it be the family's call after we explain them the advantages and disadvantages of both tests thank you ma'am i request dr jayshri jadhav madam to give expert opinion and remarks on this topic excellent talk excellent excellent dear prathna i always like your lectures uh, quite a difficult topic but you have made it very simple for us Uh, as if i am feeling i was uh, sitting in a medical college hall <laughs> so you should start uh, teaching medical student also so thank uh, you you have covered many uh, means much common uh, soft markers as much as possible uh, although the management of each soft marker is dif uh, different but i strongly believe that the detection of any abnormal uh, finding or soft marker the management should precede Preceded by the detailed study of the patient by the expert hand, and I like your uh, that uh, sentence. Not only screening, screening, screening. We should must come to a final diagnosis. And genetic sonography is almost beneficial in those women also more than thirty five and thirteen uh, up to thirty nine years of age uh, who want to avoid invasive test. Uh, and with this uh, soft markers, along with uh, biochemical screening. we uh, i think we we will uh, increase the anoplidy detection rate but the main problem with us is the only counseling part of the patient and i think we will send patient to you for that purpose thanks <laughs> thank uh, you Karla, excellent job thank you thank, thank you, you ma'am uh, i will request dr uh, pikesha sir to have some add ons on this topic can you guide us what do you want me to say do you want to say any add on uh, sure, things sure. on this okay i think uh, i've been listening to both uh, sujith and prathna they have covered this topic so beautifully so there is nothing much to add for a simple reason is that the completeness of these two topics was a thing which i was looking for and these two relatively younger lads have done it so beautifully that people who have not heard them there will be something great because these topics are not covered like this again and again so i am very thankful to you sujith and pratnam you done fantastic job continue doing this job and whenever you get more time explain to people but this time was enough for you to cover it is something beautiful i enjoyed listening to both of you congratulations and wish you all the very best for all your future activities very good 
your blessings matter a lot sir yeah prarthana nice yes. thank you sir uh to prarthana madam uh when there is a arsa and we are doing amniocentesis the report has came as negative then are you going to advise the patient follow up to d echo or if it is normal then you are not going to advise whenever there is arsa first thing is the person who has diagnosed arsa the person's responsibility to complete the detail cardiac evaluation first part if we are picked up suppose at 16 weeks then yes definitely we have to follow up with the fetal echo at either 19 weeks or 22 weeks or 23 weeks because we know that the major cardiac anomalies definitely will be picked up by 16 weeks but the evolving cardiac changes can present themselves in later stage of gestation so yes that is first part secondly as you said negative report is it for karyotype or is it for microarray or is it only fish suppose only karyotype is normal no i will not stop there i will advise the couple to go for microarray also that's why when we do amnio in these patients what we normally do is uh, i send the sample first for fish what happens is the fish report comes around 48 hours and the fish report shows there is trisomy 21 okay then there is no need of microarray in that particular patient only karyotype to confirm what fish is given will be adequate again here fish plus karyotype the total cost is less but if the fish report has come normal that means we are ruled out the trisomy 21 then we ask the lab to proceed with the microarray because it is going to cover the rest of the condition that we are thinking here so the cost of fish with microarray will be more that is what we normally do only fish at first day, on day one explain to the family that after two days we decide what will be your next step that will be easy but and if we uh, get is it compulsory to do microarray for all the arsa patients if it's uh, better to do because i discussed earlier in micro arsa we can have other single gene disorders also see here again the uh, as we are in marathwada na we have to always think about the cost involved for the patient yes, yes. so yes, microarray yes. all may not accept but at yes. least we can explain them that it will definitely help you out if they accept good enough if they can't then at least let us go for carry out okay okay thank you ma'am I request Dr. Ujwala Devri, Madam, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sachin Nichite, Sir, for our next talk. Welcome, you, Sir. Thank you, Madam. Welcome, Dr. Sachin Nichite, Sir. Fellowship in he does fellowship in fetal medicine, consultant and director of two preter fetal medicine center, Parshi, Washi, and Kharga, and other women. He is a speaker. was speaker for many national and international conferences he is a member of fetal medicine committee foxy he is a member of imaging science committee foxy he is a committee member for fetal medicine committee anox and he is author of two editions of passing dnb obstetric and gynecology and the rise of super me i invite dr sachin nichite to talk on nt scan a window at a party welcome sir Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much. Am I audible properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is my screen seen? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, respected PK sir. Uh, good evening, Pardesi sir, Doctor Sujit, Doctor Prathana, all my seniors and colleagues. Uh, this story started long back. you know before this apple was eaten uh, everybody was very happy or uh, there was no obstetrics no, no obstetrics no gynecology uh, once this apple was eaten uh, the journey of this sperm started he crossed so many barriers so many seas and reached and finally reached the target uh, nowadays so many ivf centers artificial techniques they reduce a little bit burden of this sperm to reach to the ovum but agar yahan tak pahunche hai to are there problem solved will they live happily forever or at least live will they live happily for 9 months the answer we don't know the answer is no and the first interrogation point for us is the 11 to 14 week scan or also we call it as nt scan uh, now uh, since many years we are talking about window of opportunity window of opportunity now that era has gone now everybody knows what is the importance of nt scan uh, i want to take this talk little in a practical way you know that explaining to the audience that how important is nt scan that era is gone now now what is important is how to conduct an nt scan 
uh, how to do an nt scan and how to see those opportunities in the, in the nt scan so wh what are those windows we are looking for one is uh, accurate dating second aneuploidy screening as you know everybody the screening of neural tube defects uh, pe screening this topic is picking up the picking up the importance a lot these days uh, early anatomic survey you know some people call it as as early anomaly scan also or uh, they call it as 11 to 14 weeks anomaly scan that's a correct terminology and this is an uh, the important scan for uh, selection prior to cvs and fetal reduction uh, i will put few lines at the end so uh, what i'm going to talk in this you know in a practical way i will show you one magical section two comprehensive sweeps how to examine the fetus two uterine arteries four classic biometric measurements five markers of aneuploidy six beautiful appearances eight anatomic structures and nine detectables which should be detected in this scan so what is that magical section this is one magical section you know suppose a person doing ultrasound or if you are sitting on an obstetrician desk can you see this image in your uh, sonologist report then there is no need to uh, verify for that examiner you know this is one magical section every ultrasound sonographer uh, uh, aims to master slowly you know, so how what are the characteristics of this magical section one is uh, 75% screen should be occupied by fetus it should be midline you know nasal bone diencephalon this should be seen in the section the fetus should be in the neutral position you know there should be a liker pocket between chin and the thorax no over extension fetus should be in a neutral position and the end point should be seen clearly so this is called as a magical section this gives this only single image gives us a lot of information what is that information you know first of all isuog says this is the best part for accurate dating you know uh, if this criteria is fulfilled and i measure a crl and correct the dating by this crl is the best time to correct the dating you know you no need to uh, uh, take lmp or menstrual age as the accurate one this is the most accurate one as per isuog then what we see we see a diencephalon in the center you know that gives us a fair idea about the brain development second nasal bone you know already dr prathana has discussed the same marker is seen in nt scan also third is it you know i mentioned one word about screening for uh, neural tube defects now these are the two parallel lines you know you see two parallel lines here so that is a developing midbrain you know uh if these two parallel lines are properly formed as in this image then we we do not suspect a developing neural tube defect although cannot be ruled out 100% but a open tube defect usually these two lines will be approximated it will be maybe less or a obliterated intracranial translucency then we see a new a nuchal translucency everybody knows that we get to know the heart rate we see the cord insertion we rule out uh, exemphalos and gastrocesis we see the spine so this much uh, this much of valuable information we'd get in a single section two comprehensive sweeps you know everybody has to master these sweeps if these two sweeps are seen uh, then the scan is over almost you know one is longitudinal we start from side we see the hand we see the leg we come to the magical section nasal bone nuchal translucency it heart cord insertion spine other leg and other hand so one sweep gives us so much of information now we have gone from side to side we will go from top to the bottom so from top to the bottom i see a butterfly nice intracranial structures i see orbits i see pmt that is the palate section i see nice four chamber cardiac view i see stomach bubble ac section i may, may see kidneys and two lower limbs so these are two comprehensive sweeps you know no, no need to see for each and every section do these two sweeps seen or if i have mastered two sweeps my scan is almost done two uterine arteries 
so i start reverse way you know suppose i have done two sweeps now i come to the preeclampsia screening this topic is the hottest topic in fetal medicine foundation nowadays uh, for uh, obstetrician what is more important is uh, it has a big role in uh, nt scan uh, some criteria we see while taking in uh, the uterine arteries that is three consecutive waveforms should be seen normal waveforms PSV more than 60 to ensure that we have not interrogated any other vessel than the uterine artery. Uh, the gate should be 2 mm, that is a wide enough gate to encounter complete uterine artery. The angle should be less than 30. Most important for, for everybody is the notching of uterine artery, uh, unilateral rise of PI is no more valid. it is only the mean pi that means right pi plus left pi divided by 2 that is the value we have to take uh, we use centile charts for comparing you know whether the pi is increased or decreased uh, for uh, obstetrician we can take 2.5 is the cut off beyond that it is an increased pi now we usually do not take pi as a sole parameter we take age bmi pi and the biochemistry and combined we take a risk calculation suppose these facilities are not available biochemical markers not available you can simply take decision based on mean pi also two two prevention measures we do after mean pi one is aspirin that everybody knows 150 mg no more 70 150 mg bed time that is the most important uh, prevention measure it is a magical measure to be done and this has to be conveyed to the patient that how important is ecosprin because it is very frequent to uh, get gastritis because of aspirin and if the patient is not motivated to take the aspirin he, he simply quits aspirin for 5 days 10 days till the patient feels good so that counseling is important the patient to be labeled as high risk for preeclampsia patient has to be counseled for development of preeclampsia because it should not come as a surprise to the patient you know it is very important in a medical legal world four classic measurements everybody takes in all scans bpd ac fli we must take in nt scan also although we do not label growth restriction or overgrowth based on these parameters at nt scan but these acts act like a baseline measurements for me five markers everybody talks about them you know one is nt one is nasal bone ductus venosus and tricuspid these are classic markers for aneuploidy detection we will come to them later on again six beautiful images here this is important uh, we we considered nt scan as a as a early anomaly scan but as as everybody know that the anatomic structures are not developed yet you know they are still in a developing phase but we can uh, estimate the developing problems or we can at least detect those problems which are well established as this gestation how to do that you know first appearance is intracranial this is a beautiful i okay well, it is a butterfly appearance nice two cerebrum developing cerebrums on two sides and we see a fac cerebrum we rule out so many problems by a single picture only we rule out holoprosen cephaly we we rule out uh, hydrogen cephaly so many problems just by looking at this single image this is pre maxillary triangle uh, we can rule out palate abnormalities or at least we can suspect and uh, put the patient in a uh, a uh, 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 high risk case to uh, analyze in in the later scans this is v and two parallel signs this is for cardiac evaluation uh, heart evaluation is uh, very difficult at this gestation but if somebody knows that taking two parallel signs that is two ventricular inflows and two outflows coming together that is v sign this can be seen very nicely on the scans Uh, what is the importance of these signs is you know suppose we are doing suppose you are doing scans on a lower end machines at least you should be able to pick up that this is not seen you know wh- why this is why these webinars are important we this is not to train you for the ultimate scan you know at least if you are putting a probe on the patient's abdomen you should be able to pick up that ye sahi nahi lag raha hai you know we should refer this to dr sujit dr prarthana 
दैट ये सही नहीं लग रहा है ना तो इनको इनके पास भेज देते दैट मच इज मोर देन इनफ दैट इज द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ दिस वेबिनार या आपके दिमाग में रिंग होना चाहिए कि दिस इज नॉट सीन करेक्टली दीज आर द इमेजेस वॉट आई वॉन्ट आई वॉन्ट यू टू गेट प्रिंटेड ऑन योर ब्रेन देन वी कम टू दिस हैप्पी मैन साइन दैट इज फॉर द टू अम्बलिकल आर्टरीज एंड रेलवे ट्रैक साइन दैट इज दाइन दीज आर द ब्यूटिफुल इमेजेस eight organs we see that is two limbs to hands with fingers we can very easily detect absence of hand absence of upper limb radial ray also can be detected so early very nicely we see two limbs two kidneys on the two sides and two orbits uh, very tiny structures but uh, many a times it is very important you know especially especially if we are selecting a patient for fetal reduction so going in this much detail is very important you know we cannot just select upper fetus and reduce it if i go through all these small 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 parts i get more convinced that which fetus to be reduced nine detectables so after all all the scan is done nine abnormalities we must be detecting at this stage one is acrania absence of skull oloprosencephaly encephalocele exemphalos gastrocesis mega cystis bladder dilatation body stock abnormality distorted body missing limbs inian cephaly the spine problems these nine problems must be detectable that is why they are standard internationally called as nine detectables uh, i will just talk about this ideal picture okay this is the picture of a, a proper nt scan why why it is important i am telling you Uh, whether i am doing you are doing scan or not doing why is it important see there are uh, three category of sonologist nowadays one is fetal medicine consultant one is uh, sonologist and one is sonologist with fetal medicine accreditation so sometimes what is happening is see uh, mostly fetal medicine cons consultants will not compromise in this image okay we uh, we are passionate and we are Uh, dedicated to get this image even if it, it takes one hour two hour also uh, a sonologist which is not fmf accredited uh, that image you must be identifying and more important is there are some sonologist which have submitted images got that id got that id but they may not be delivering these images every every patient you know that that is more important so as a obstetrician sitting on the desk you must be identifying the sonologist whether are they following this criteria or not this is not a myth that is a uh, obstetrician has to understand this image is not a myth that everybody talks are ye nt lena hai thoda idhar udhar chalta hai that criteria in this current era for managing patients screening out patients and medico legally this image is very important so what are the criteria of this image one is a tip of the nasal bone should be seen a parallel sign the skin and the bone should be seen a square shaped palate square shaped palate a circular diencephalon and the nt the lining behind the neck is called as nt should be seen clearly the fetus should be in the neutral position that is a, a, a liker pocket between chin and the thorax not like this not like this if this way this way the nt measurement is false the gain should be turned down because the edges of nt uh, the caliper placement there should not be fuzzy edges chalky edges nahi hona chahiye there should be accurate pl placement of the calipers like this the caliper has to be placed inner to inner so that is how nt has to be measured if suppose there is a umbilical cord you know sometimes you put a probe and you see there is something not correct behind put a color you will see that there, there is a loop of umbilical cord so you measure on both sides of umbilical cord and average that is 1 plus plus 2 divided by 2 will give you the ideal nt that is how nt should be put now i come to the tips of taking uh, nt scan this is for the people who uh, do scans you know uh, in their own opd or some some are fetal medicine some are developing fetal medicine so the window of opportunity does not apply only 
to the fetal screening the window of opportunity applies to the sonologist to the fetal medicine that kaise opportunity dhoond ke mera time save karke mujhe patient ko image deliver karni hai these are these are my tips the tips are stick the pick trick groom with zoom power of pivoting retake with cine strength of sleeping pro putting nose in bing and trouble shooting i will go one by one fast stick the pick ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है इफ यू आर लर्निंग और यू आर डूइंग एंटी स्कैन ये पिक्चर चिपका दो सामने यू यूर ब्रेन इज सो स्ट्रॉन्ग नो इट स्टार्ट अप्लाइंग वेदर ऐसा दिखता है कि अंदर दिस इज द इजिएस्ट एंड फास्टेस्ट वे टू लर्न एंटी है ना पूजा करो उस पिक्चर की सेकेंड इज ग्रूम मिज जूम सी द फर्स्ट वन है नो मेनी पीपल डू लाइक दिस दे सी सम नेजल बोन एंटी दिस पॉज एंड देन द जूम So look at the second picture. You know, I have already zoomed the image. I cut and zoom. It is very easy to go get those parameters for the NT scan. That is groom with zoom. Power of pivoting. This is important for learning NT scan. There are two complexes we see when we take a, a proper NT image. You know, this is nasal bone complex. Tip of the nasal bone two parallel. That is nasal bone and the skin. This is nasal bone complex. This is called as NTIT complex, you know, behind NT and one intracranial translucency we discussed. So, दोनों एक साथ लाने की कोशिश करेंगे तो बहुत टाइम लगेगा, फ्रस्ट्रेशन आएगा इन अर्ली अर्ली पार्ट ऑफ योर ट्रेनिंग और डूइंग स्कैन्स. तो what is pivoting is एक को लाओ स्क्रीन में, keep your probe constant and try to without moving that pivot, try to put the another one in the image. You know, you get the image very nicely. That is called as power of pivoting. Retake with Cine. When you are learning to take NT scan, uh, very common tendency that जब NT आएगा तभी freeze करो और image लो. It doesn't come many times. You get frustrated. So what is use the Cine view? You know, आपका image आके चला गया है. It has gone. You know, it has gone. Pause it. Do Cine Cine roll roll roll. You get the image correctly. Art of sleeping probe. अगर NT सीखना है अगर प्रोप को सुलाना नहीं आया है यू कैन नॉट टेक एंटी यू नो फीटस विल नॉट कम एंड शो यू दैट आई एम हियर टेक माय एंटी सो द स्लीपिंग प्रोब आर्ट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ट्राई इन योर ओन पेशेंट इन एनी जेस्टेशन ट्राई इट यू गेट मोर एंगल्स मोर फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी इन टेकिंग पुटिंग नोज इन द बीम सपोज वन ऑफ द कॉम्प्लेक्स इज द नेजल बोन कॉम्प्लेक्स ओके इफ आई पुट माई अल्ट्रासाउंड प्रोब इन ऑब्लिक वे Many times I do not get nasal bone properly. I may not get the image. The nasal bone has to be perpendicular almost. You know, see like this oblique. If I get it perpendicular, nice shining nasal bone I get. So that is putting nose in the beam. Trouble shooting. Trouble shooting. मतलब कुछ भी करने से नहीं जम रहा है, कुछ difficult लग रहा है. So a sonologist must know कि ऊपर से कैसा दिख रहा है. Immediate अगर मैं TVS probe डालूँगा तो मुझे NT का image आएगा. That training your eyes has to get. That is abdo TBS adjustment. You know how the how the fetus is looking abdominally. Immediate within a minute, if you put a probe, you get an empty image. That orientation you must get. Ulta ka pulta. Suppose fetusing line up upside down. You just flip it, provided the FMF criteria is are fulfilled. Look it. Look at here. See nice nasal bone empty. I get. This is ulta ka pulta. Shirshasan, you will say the fetus is upside down. The legs are hanging up. Nahi milega NT. This is the best position for a doctor's venosus. Take the DV. Totally awkward position hai. To bhai baitho, pani piyo, gumo, kha pi ke ao. That is the best way. Ek ghante ke baad ao. Last point I want to say: window of opportunity is not only for aneuploid screening; it is for the procedures. You know, you are obstetrician; you want to refer the patient at the correct time to the fetal medicine consultant. Why you are referring? A triplet pregnancy, a quadruplet pregnancy, a patient uh, with both parents has thalassemia trait, maybe a diagnosed single gene disorder, uh, maybe a previous Down syndrome baby. Don't refer them at later than 16 weeks. You are wasting time. You know, for molecular studies, it takes lot of time. Best time is uh, at uh, after NT scan doing CBS. So placental localization is very important. I the NT scan with placental localization. Sometimes we have to rule out in which patient we cannot do CBS. We have to rule out uh, CBS patients. 
so we have to see some hematomas some abnormal placentas where we i don't want to put my needle inside it so i if i have to decide whether the whether to postpone the patient for amniocentesis nt scan evaluation is the must for reduction fetal selection is done by nt scan this is a big window of opportunity uh, i want to select the fetus to reduce this scan is important and labeling of the fetus by nt scan is the first and best time to label the fetuses and to reduce it thank you so much don't underestimate the power of nt scan belief system passion and patience is the key to nt scan don't only take uh, fmf id and i am i am done don't look in the images of fmf id operator and trust that image is taken it has to be taken consistently <clears throat> consistently consistently thank you so much thank you so much sir for such a wonderful beautiful and diagrammatic representation i have never thought in my life that nt scan would be such a easy topic and you have reminded us of our residential days where we used to make some mnemonics and you <laughs> we used to make uh, some correlation with some pictures thank you so much sir thank you so much thank you i request dr jayshri jadhav ma'am to give expert opinion and remarks for this topics fantastic crispy talk uh, dr sachin sir thank you, you have opened thank you so much many, many windows of opportunities with many tips and tricks that will definitely help out uh, us in while doing ultrasound in thank my you so opinion much, advantage of first trimester detection of fetal defects uh, has certain advantages like good delineation of normal fetal anatomy with identific identification of several fetal defects secondly is and safety of first trimester uh, trimester mtp after detection of fetal defect and uh, because there is a fairly a lesser degree of parental fetal bonding along with uh, social privacy also we can maintain so thanks sir excellent talk thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you sir thanks to all the three excellent speakers which we have today and i think we should close now this webinar with a, such a excellent speak uh, on the behalf of chalisga obstetric and gynec society i would like to thank our chief guest dr pk sha sir who has taken his precious time for us and uh, i would like to thank dr rajendra singh pardesi sir dr ajay mane sir dr sujit konkar sir dr yashwan pawar sir dr mandar sir and lastly to the main speakers who are excellent speaker we have got a lot of knowledge from today session dr sujit sir dr prarthana ma'am and dr sachin sir for a wonderful wonderful presentation and thank you shield healthcare and their team and to all the participants who has made this webinar successful thank you so much